Hi, and welcome to Epicenter Aftershock. These Aftershock podcasts are wholly sponsored, which means that everyone you hear on this edition of the show paid to be here. But that's okay, because we have some amazing sponsors. If you're looking for the regular edition of Epicenter, just look for the numbered episodes in your podcast player. Today, my guests are Zen Huang and Leonard Tan of Taurus. Taurus is a flexible, decentralized key management system designed to be accessible to everyone. At the core of the Taurus stack is the Taurus network, and its function is to generate cryptographic key shares using Shamir secret sharing. People can use the Web2 services they know, like email and social media accounts, to log into Web3 services and DeFi apps. This promotes a user-centric key management environment without sacrificing usability. Taurus provides web and mobile native support, and unlike other solutions which try to solve the UX complexities of key management, well, it's blockchain agnostic. In fact, it's compatible with non-blockchain applications as well. What's great about Taurus is that it's easily accessible for developers and integrating Taurus into your Web3 app takes just a few minutes. From the application's perspective, Taurus is just another Web3 provider and adding it to your app means that you simply have to import the library and pass it as a parameter to the Web3 object. Have a look at docs.tor.us for the quick start guide. Once it's integrated, your users will be able to create a crypto wallet by logging into Google, Facebook, Twitter, or about a dozen other services they support. There are a few things I really appreciated about this company and what they've built. First, well, they've built a company that combines a SaaS business model and blockchain infrastructure, which I think is really cool. They're focused on providing a core key management infrastructure layer, which combined with other solutions can create a highly secure yet easily usable system for key recovery. And finally, this infrastructure is useful not only for Web3 apps, but any use case which might leverage public private key infrastructure. This extends to things like encrypted data storage, encrypted email, and so on. And any progress in terms of facilitating access to these types of applications, I think is positive. We're seeing more and more applications which leverage cryptography as a means to protect people's data and privacy. And I can see a future where these apps could simply allow users to bring their own keys much like we've seen in the crypto space. And having access to a public good like the Taurus network makes it a lot easier for folks to have a higher level of sovereignty over their keys. So with that, here's my conversation with Zen Huang and Leonard Tan. I'm here with Zen Huang and Leonard Tan of the Taurus team. And today we're going to be talking about Taurus and the products that they've built to help people manage their keys. So Taurus is a universal decentralized key management system. It's designed to be accessible to everyone. Uh, it uses like really advanced uh, threshold cryptography, and it's being used by hundreds of applications and you know hundreds of thousands of uh, of users per month. Um, and uh, they're helping make it easier for people to manage their keys in crypto. And we know that this is um, well. A big problem. Uh, it's always been sort of the crux of the crypto problem is like, how do you manage your keys? And we've come a long way from having air gap laptops, uh, you know, seven or eight years ago to now having really user friendly and mature solutions uh, for people to manage your crypto keys. So Zen and Leonard, thanks for joining me today. No, thanks so much yeah, thanks for the for introduction. Us, yeah. um, thanks for having us. Uh, it's actually a pleasure to be on this show. We've mm. been big fans of it for a while. Exactly, so I followed every time of the podcast. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's ago, great yeah. to finally um, like kind of talk. Um, yeah, and uh, it's it's uh, it. We we we're just excited for this to happen. Yeah, cool. So tell me a little bit about your background and how you guys uh, became involved in crypto. So that was for me actually. Uh, the first, my first involvement of crypto was uh, with Dogecoin. I'm not sure if you remember um, the of Reddit course. community. <laughs> <laughs> they had amazing, an amazing trailer. Um, I think it was like Dogecoin to the moon, where Doge would be fly. I mean, if you guys haven't watched it, uh, you guys should definitely watch it. it it's it's a piece of art. It's a classic. <laughs> It was, it was my first foray into uh, cryptocurrencies. Back then, Bitcoin was interesting to me and I mined a little bit, but um, it wasn't until Ethereum came about when I really, really got hooked. I actually managed to chance upon um, Vitalik whilst I was working at a VC uh, back uh, way back then. And 
Um, and he he just gave a talk and he did it in you know everybody else was in a fintech convention mm. and um, they were in like suits and all but he was in a unicorn shirt and but he was so eloquent and he has his own yeah. charisma all around him and um, from then on it was just kind of like a rabbit hole and downhill from there just full crypto <laughs> all the way <laughs> so I see. yeah uh, so I used to work on uh, previous uh, plasma research and all mm. um, and. Uh, Leonard used That's to That's kind of where I met Zen also. Yeah. Like we were schoolmates, but we only really got to meet each other like what when Zen was working at um on his plasma peace bridge, right? That's yes, one. Yes. So for me, um I started a, a lot later, actually, like twenty early twenty seventeen. Um and then I, I was working on a side project with my friends. And we had only just found out Ethereum. Back in the day there was no Infura. So in order to do any querying at all, you had to run your own Ethereum node. And um, which cost you five hundred dollars a month. <laughs> so I, I got we got that spun up. We wrote this quick project to like prevent ticket rescalping and all that. Ran into a bunch of problems, and at that point I was pretty much hooked. I mean, it, it's like a, once you get into the ecosystem, there's a lot to explore, and there's a lot of uh, like like things that I want to learn. Um, and also, um, I, I majored in finance and economics, and I, I'm a I was just, it was just like a good crossroad, right? Because finance, mm. economics, and software engineering, that's pretty much what crypto is all about. Yeah. So I did that. And then um, I went out to do a corporate job at Visa. And then meanwhile, um, I was still exploring this thing. And when the opportunity came, I decided to go for it and start doing um, more blockchain work. And this was also part of consensus and then after that I did Taurus together with Zen while yeah. we were doing some so, research. So Taurus really started yeah. off as a side project. Sebastian. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, we, we were trying to explore um, it was actually, ring signatures. Yes. I think. So yeah. the name comes, you know, Taurus, Taurus is a actually, donut chip. Yeah. Go it ahead. comes from a ring. So we were trying to explain, uh, so we we're trying to do um, an, a private information marketplace. So at, back in the day when we were exploring this, this, this technology, we realized the potential for it to be able to, um, for, for information reselling. And one of the problems with information is that it suffers from the problems of a public good in the sense that once you sell it once, you can't resell it. And that can be solved with things like designated verifier signatures. Via ring signatures. Via so, ring signatures. Uh, yeah. But we quickly really realized that uh, you know, ring signatures basically require for everybody to have public keys. And mm. nobody had PGP keys. Yes. Nobody had any keys at all. There was no way to identify users at all, even if you wanted to so tie identity. So we just identity. went back and back and tried to solve each problem. And we uh, we kind of chanced upon like the Taurus infrastructure and architecture at that point in time. Mm. And we really felt that it would be a great way to kind of uh, make public key infrastructure accessible to everybody mm. and usable by everybody. And that just became our mission and vision and what we tried to solve in the ecosystem as well mm. as time moved on. Exactly. Um, so the rest is so history. Yeah, the rest we got, just We got funding evolved. from Binance and yeah. then uh, we just kind of just... Pretty much just came up for us trying to solve the de like the developer tooling problem uh, that, that didn't exist back then. Time really flies. It's been two years. <laughs> yeah, it certainly does. In fact, I was just, uh, we were talking earlier that Zen, uh, we met uh, at ETC last year. Tell us what uh, what have you been able to accomplish in the last year since, uh, well, I guess almost a year, like nine months or so. Uh, what what uh, what has come about in, in the Taurus uh, product line since then? At the start of the year, we launched a new product called, uh, or a way of integrating Taurus called Direct Auth. So for those uh, viewers who don't know us out there, um, uh, go check out app.tor.us. It's really a lot easier for you guys to check it out and feel the experience for yourselves. Um, and what you get from a application that integrates either the Taurus wallet or um, Taurus key management in general, any one of the SDKs, mm -hmm. is you get a Web2 experience via... Google, Facebook, Reddit, or even passwordless yeah, yeah. logins uh, on a Web3 application. And uh, this is, and we uh, and we launched earlier in the year a different way to uh, integrate um, the Taurus key management. We basically, uh, we made it directly it. embedded yeah. into applications. We also uh, launched in this year a, uh, a, a key management architecture called Tiki. Mm. which um, is another abstraction over the Taurus network. And I'll go a little bit more into uh, those sure, abstractions we'll, we'll, and we'll how keys are managed a little bit further yeah. down the line. Mm. But uh, it's uh, we've just basically been busy listening to developer requests. Yes. They ask us, oh, 
would this be possible? And then we go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then yeah, we build yeah, it for them. We build it for them um, and then see how much, yeah, how much so, traction it gets. So yeah. uh, it's been, it's been, so Direct Off has been great. Uh, mm. We've really managed to come a long way with both the Direct Off and Taurus wall integrations as well as Tiki. Mm. Um, to date, we are directly integrated into over 250 applications. Mm. We're seeing over 100K monthly active users with hundreds of thousands of authentications. Uh, we're really happy with where we've come today. We're really mm. excited to, uh, uh, to for what's coming in the future as well. So Taurus is is a, a bunch of different things, right? So like there's the Taurus network, which we'll talk about. Mm. Uh, there's the Taurus wallet. Um, there is this direct auth um, product, and there's there's Tiki. So mm. let's let's talk about the Taurus network there. What, what is the Taurus network, and what? Or that maybe makes sense to kind of right. So the base is exactly as you said. The base layer is the Taurus network. Everything else are like wrappers around it. Like the Taurus wallet is a wrapper around the Taurus network so that you have a user user interface to actually use the Ethereum blockchain. And that comes with a bunch of things like showing what tokens you have, what CryptoKitties or what ERC721s you have. So that's just one of the products. Direct Auth is an SDK that allows you to integrate it. And then Tiki is yet another abstraction layer on top of Taurus network, which we'll cover later. So starting with the base layer, um, it is basically this thing called DKG. So uh, it's distributed key generation. And for those that, that are unfamiliar, um, the idea is basically a, a group of servers and or nodes um, come together. They all generate a key jointly. They participate in this DKG process and they generate a key. At no point is the key ever reconstructed. And at the end of this process, you get shares of these keys on each one of these nodes. And you need a threshold number of them, so majority of these servers, to be able to reconstruct the key. And we run this process, this DKG on the Taurus network, in parallel to a separate uh, a layer, which is which does the mapping. So this DKG layer does um, this key generation. And then this mapping layer allows users to tie um, their social accounts or any type of login, really, that has a unique ID to one of these keys. And and um, so it's generic. We it's support generic, yeah. we support basically uh, any JWT login, or um, we also support in specific the OAuth two standard. Mm. And um, this is a standard that, uh, if people aren't familiar with, it's what like Google, Google Facebook, users, Facebook, WeChat, users. all of your different uh, login solutions that allow other people to log in. It's a specification by Web uh, OAuth two. Yeah. Uh, it's a, Open it's ID, a yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a specification that. Uh, is widely used in the Web two space. And, yeah, so this um, is uh, you know the uh, login with your Google account or login with your Facebook exactly, account that exactly, every exactly. website uses these yes. days. Yeah, exactly. So the combination of this allows basically for a network to store, assign, generate, and allow people to retrieve, retrieve these public private key pairs via these modes of authentication. So this is the base layer doing its day-to-day -day operation, but there are other things that, that you need to solve before this is actually usable and secure. Mm -hmm. So you need to solve issues around replay attacks. How do you prevent a, a, um, somebody from taking your Google token and replaying it to get your key? You need to solve things like migration. So let's say one of the servers decides to call it quits. I don't want to run a node anymore. So you want to migrate to a different set of servers. How do you that, do that without losing people's keys? How do you do that so you don't even reuse the same shares. So there's a protocol for that called share refresh, and we've also implemented that. Um, you also have to think about issues like asynchronicity, like how do you make sure that a single server isn't able to delay a login for very long? So these are all problems that um, the Taurus network solves, and, and interested readers can just go find out more. Um, it's based off uh, Cashin's paper from 2002. So the Taurus network is really the the base layer that powers all of these user applications on top. And the, the way I like to think of the Taurus network is it's a distributed system that does key share generation. Like that that's kind of its yes. only function. It's just generate keys and store those keys for later retrieval. And yes. if you think of that level, if you, if you kind of abstract away the applications, it's kind of a, a nice public utility to have because you can use this for all kinds of applications beyond crypto. I mean, like if we think about um, wanting people to or you know, encouraging people or uh, to, to to encrypt like their their data on cloud storage or to mm -hmm. encrypt their email, like this is a really 
good public utility to have at the disposal of all kinds of applications that could potentially benefit from from having this kind of like key generation system. Is, is this something that you think about when exploring what perhaps like Taurus Network could become in terms of like a utility? Do you, do you think about Definitely. other types I mean, of applications? We actually... Check this off start. Yeah, um, and... Uh, basically, direct auth and the Taurus wall and all are just different ways of integrating with the Taurus network. And direct auth is uh, allows any application to directly um, assign, store, and retrieve keys. Uh, and we really see the Taurus network as kind of like a decentralized Amazon Cognito, for example, or a decentralized Google off Firebase, zero. if you are, well, or zero. off zero, yeah. if you. It's like it's like that back end which. Uh, which you can interact with to store and, uh, and do your user authentication and all of that. But, um, but it's instead of it being one centralized entity, AWS or something like that, it's distributed and decentralized um, out uh, into a node set. Mm. So the Taurus network generates shares uh, of keys that are uh, generating using Shamir secret sharing. Um, I'm not an expert on cryptography, but I, I've got the basics about how, how this stuff works. And I know that there are different ways in which you can generate key shares. So Shamir secret sharing is one. There's also the ECDSA threshold signature um, algorithm that other systems use. I, know, I think like Zengo uses this for their facial recognition uh, key generation system. Uh, and then, of course, there's other methods like the, you know, if you look at um, you know, Argent or Gnosis Safe, you know, they, uh, they do key generation uh, using a smart contract. Mm. Talk about the process which led you to use uh, Shamir Secret Sharing, and you know, did you explore some of these other methods? Uh, mm. and, and why, why, why choose this particular technology? So one of the main benefits of using a crypto primitive. So Shamir Secret Sharing is a crypto primitive in that it sits on the same level. The end result of Shamir Secret Sharing is always a private. primitive private key. Yeah. And um, the the main one of the big reasons we evaluated the going like the smart contract wallet style. We also evaluated uh, different forms of secret sharing. Mm. So other se- forms of secret sharing, so Shamir secret sharing, um, and um, ultimately our main goal at that point in time was to bridge Web two to Web three, and it continues to be uh, that moving forward. We we want to make. Uh, public key infrastructure universal to everybody. Mm. Um, and one, and when specifically comparing the like uh, public private key pairs and um, something smart like contract. to smart contract wallets, public private key pairs have the power of uh, like, for example, some of the things you take for granted, for example, like signatures, like representation, um, like composability across different systems. It can be used to encrypt, decrypt. Mm. These things are possible with a public-private key pair, which aren't possible with a smart contract wallet. So how, like for us, the, the way to phrase it, another way to phrase it would be like, uh, you can't really use a smart contract wallet to sign a transaction for mm. a blockchain. Um, that's one problem. The other thing is also um, keys are, are off-chain, so they don't take gas to deploy, yep. and they can potentially be private. So if you do any of this, um, this share reconstruction off-chain, um, if you have separate hierarchies or different other systems, not necessarily using Taurus, but using another different system to do it, you could keep it completely offline. So no one even knows that your key is split into how many pieces. And that could be useful like for, like let's say someone trying to coerce you, right? And if you hand me your device, you can just say, okay, you can have my device, but they don't know that your key is actually split across three devices, mm. for example. So I mean, so these you- are some of the benefits. Um, the other big one, I think, is also cross-chain compatibility. Smart contract wallets are only Ethereum, and Ethereum has a bunch of applications, but it, there are also other chains, right? Like like Bitcoin's a chain, uh, a bunch and of other chains. And beyond like chains, right? Yeah. So uh, we also want to, like public key infrastructure is not supported just in, in, exactly. in the general mainstream applications yeah. and use cases today. Mm. And you've seen certain applications, I'm not sure if you've tried the messenger like Signal, mm. or back in the day, uh, Keybase. Uh, Keybase, yeah. yeah. Um, so these guys are also trying to proliferate public key infrastructure and we share the same ideal and mission of them. It's right. just to make it mainstream and make it accessible on applications just beyond blockchain as well. Mm. Right, so okay. One, so with Samir Secret thing, Sharing, they, 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 by, by generating keys that are, are cryptographic primitives, you open mm. up potentially you know, all like kinds of other applications outside of, of crypto, but also just generally like 
these keys are compatible with any crypto, any blockchain. Exactly. One more correction about yes. threshold signatures and Sharma secret sharing. Threshold signatures actually require Sharma secret sharing. So threshold signatures already, um, they, they, they assume that you already have a key split to shares. And then you can use that to do some protocol called threshold signature protocol, and then use that to generate a normal uh, signature. So if you want to support threshold signatures, you already need to do Shami secret sharing. Yeah. What are some of the pitfalls of of um, of Shamir secret sharing? So I, I I I'm curious if there's any security or sort of like threat model disadvantages of using this particular technology, and if you've thought about ways to mitigate those. Like I I, I think there's something I, I'm not sure about this, and maybe you'll correct me on this, but I believe that with Shamir secret sharing, there's necessarily the presence of a master key that is derived, and so there like. Am I correct there? Is there is there sort of like a, a master key generation process and from which the shares are derived or is it a more horizontal process? It, it, there is no master key. The best way to explain it is actually visually. So um, imagine if you draw a line, right? A straight line. Mm. And you have three points on the line, right? If you only have one of those points, you can't, you can't get back your line because any number of lines can go to a single point. But with two points, you can and this is basically a, a two out of three Shamir secret sharing. And um, this is true for higher powers. true for X. higher powers. So right? for like three X squared, you need three, three points. points. X cubed, you need four points. And so on. And, and, and you can do this. This is Shamir secret sharing at its core. And, and you can do this uh, uh, um, uh, multiple times. And the reason why you want to do this is if you have just one line, the person who drew the line knows the line, right? And that's kind of maybe where you read about like the master secret and all that. Like there's a dealer, that's the official cryptographic term. The dealer knows yeah. the secret, yes. So the problem, that's the problem with Shamir secret sharing. And, and DKGs, distributed key generation, solves that by running N rounds of Shamir secret sharing. So everybody creates their own line. And if you sum up all the points across these multiple different lines, you get something that is still a Shamir secret share, but Nobody knows the line because everyone contributed randomness to it. Mm. So that's the you can't derive the the original lines because you have to add up all these different values to get to the exactly. Everyone has to has Mm. to have all the lines. So I mean, Shamir secret sharing in itself because it's a primitive form doesn't really. It's hard to find. Like I mean, that the it allows you to split it into a threshold manner. But a lot of the problems arise when you try to use Shamir secret sharing in a. In a in a usable form, exactly. So the for example, aren't security. It's yeah. more usability. So it's yeah. more it's it's more like um like how just like how what Leonard just mentioned. We want to generate it in a distributed manner. How do we do that? And mm. that's how what DKG solved. But it's also like oh um we uh we have shares now, right? But what if we want to revoke the share? What mm. if we want to? What if we lost our phone and one of our shares are there and we don't want it anymore? So mm. revocability. What if um, our devices are offline, how do we refresh shares? How do we ensure that our key hasn't been stolen before and isn't compromised? Exactly. So it's, yeah. It's those usability problems that kind of kind of creep in and you start building features around it, they get more complicated. And uh, there's some things that are harder to achieve with Shamir secret shares than with something like a smart contract wallet. And, yeah. and the smart contract wallet is really easy, right? Just remove the key and, and that's it. <laughs> key so equals Key equals to no. That's, that's about it. <laughs> mm. And um, with Shamir secret sharing, it's slightly harder. You also need to solve other problems like incentive compatibility um, on, on when updating the structure. I guess so, on a technical level, it's also a little bit more complex mm. in that. Um, so this is just evaluating terms in terms of like, uh, do you want to build a smart contract wallet? Do you want to build? Not saying that smart contract wallet work is easy. By all means, smart contract wallet is complicated. It's mm. hard. You require the audits and all. But um, cryptographically, uh, cryptographically, uh, you have to understand the primitives a lot more, and mm. you're a bit more constricted to some of those primitives mm. relative to smart contract wallets, which have that general computation. One benefit, though, that smart contract wallets have is the easy access to Ethereum state. So uh, that's useful in a bunch of ways. Like for example, if you want to do uh, daily spending limits, mm. that's going to be quite hard on a Shamir secret share. You have to do it something like locally, but with smart contract wallets, you can enforce it on the Ethereum blockchain. So, yeah. so that's that. 
one wouldn't be prevented from using a key generated with Taurus to access a smart contract wallet. That's the thing with you know, yeah, using this exactly. primitive yeah. is that you're, you, it's basically, it's, it's your key. You can then go do whatever you want with it. Exactly. And, uh, and, and no actually, one even knows actually. You could, uh, you won't be able to tell. Right? And actually, yeah. and actually we, so via direct auth, right. Uh, we've had actually some, several wallets integrate us doing exactly just mm. that. Sky Weaver so Nose is safe. Yeah naturally just makes it accessible to everybody skyweaver um i'm not sure if you've heard of horizon games uh um but they were like they're a yeah, project invested by reddit they've also built a wallet called sequence which also integrates direct auth mm. so it's taurus key management to a smart contract wallet or to like a multi-sig so these abstractions are always entirely possible because if you're playing with a you know just a, a just cryptographic a primitive yeah a key yeah, can so. do a bunch of things right so Okay, that's really cool. Um, let's uh, let's talk a little bit more about the higher levels of abstraction uh, in the in the kind of Taurus stack. Um, well, let's maybe let's maybe dive into uh, the uh, the wallet and the direct auth. So, on top of this key management infrastructure, there's there's a wallet, which logically like allows people to store funds and you know in, interact with 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 uh, the Ethereum blockchain. What what does these what do these products look like and I think maybe uh, a good way to segue into the user experience aspect is to walk us through what the process of creating your key looks like. Like, what does a login look like for a user? And you know, in the in the background, what's happening when uh, when someone creates an account using Taurus? Mm -hmm. Can we share our screen for this one, or does it not record? Or Go for it. Yeah, I mean, so uh, okay. for those of you listening uh, on the audio podcast, uh, you, you can always um, check out the YouTube video, which will be uh, in the links um, for this episode, and you can check out this um, screen share. So for um, a returning user and as well as a new user, uh, the login process is... As you're logging in, um, Google verifies that you've logged in correctly and returns to you a signed JWT token. This token is then sent to all of the Taurus network nodes. They verify independently against Google. And then it's valid, they return the shares to you. And then in the front end, your key is reconstructed. And so that's where your key is going to stay. It's not going to leave the front end. Once you close the tab, it's gone. And this is the Taurus wallet. Uh, if you log into app.taurus, but you often see us integrated on different sites and the apps. And over there, we are running this entire process within an iframe, which then communicates with the external dApp, allows them to do MetaMask-like transactions via like like uh, confirmations and signatures. So an example is on Ave, who has integrated us, and uh, you can see that the Taurus wallet here. Essentially, this is the experience on another application with the Taurus wallet. So describe describe what you're what we're seeing here. So what we're seeing here is Ave in, Ave basically integrates a um, an SDK called the uh, Taurus, Taurus Embed, mm -hmm. um, and this loads up an iframe that runs in the background. Iframes are protected via the domain security model. When I log in, this iframe presents this modal, and when I uh, when I interact with this, I'm basically interacting with the Taurus domain and on therefore app on app yeah. us, mm -hmm. and thereby also the Taurus. Name. Okay, so this model window shows login with Google, login with Facebook, login with what, you know the, the different service providers that you support. Uh, you've clicked on login yeah, with Google. Now you're you're picking your uh, your your user account. Basically, it's a one-click login into your Aave application, and mm -hmm. a user can immediately start interacting with the application he or she wants to. Uh, do be it like trade, be it uh, like buy wearable uh, items. Or so, so important point to note about the domain security model uh, is, is that your key is kept uh, on app.tor.us domain. So Aave.com can't directly access the private key uh, in, if you're using the Taurus wallet in this way via this integration. So it's interacting and with the Web3 with the Web3 API. Web3. Similar exactly, to the there's a Web3 Metamask provider device. that routes these requests to the iframe and then it's signed there and returned back out. So this way, your key is kept safe. So if you use the Taurus wallet on like a less trusted site, it's still okay. It's the same domain security model yep. that, uh, for example, Chrome extensions like MetaMask right. and all use. It's the exact same. It's a browser. It's what the web is built on. Yep. Um, so this is the Taurus wallet integration. Mm. And uh, with this integration, we're integrated in most of the top DeFi applications out there. 
uh, you can get started here. We also have a Chrome extension, um, which is a little bit less known, mm. uh, but because users ask for it, we just basically have a Chrome extension that users can download uh, and use to interact with different applications as well. Um, we uh, and this is more of like the, to the the front ends that Taurus provides, and mm. the, the developer experience for this, right, is they get a web tree provider. That's 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 the way this integration works. Right. So a lot of it is really just built around simplifying the developer integration for for, mm -hmm. for them. So mm -hmm. we could, in theory, with just the Taurus network, return a private key and then have the developers do with everything. But that would be extremely developer unfriendly. So we built this UI, this nice interface that mimics all of these things that already used to with known Web3 providers like yep. Metamask. However, uh, we also had a lot of requests for people wanting to directly interact with the Taurus network without a pre-built UI. Yeah. They wanted full control of the user experience. They wanted to either build a wallet for themselves or have it very customized and tailored to their uh, application. Um, as such, direct auth was created. And mm. direct auth really just abstracts all of the interactions. So that key assignment that you saw, uh, uh, the, 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 the retrieval of shares, um, the reconstruction, all of it happens in the direct auth SDK on the application's front end itself. And any application can basically emulate that exact same experience by, in, uh, by integrating this. So you have the wallet, uh, which, which you've built, which is sort of like the, the base layer in terms of user experience, right? So like any application can integrate Taurus. It's transparent to the user that they're using Taurus. They can always go check their Taurus wallet you know, on the Taurus website, mm -hmm. access the funds there, et cetera. Um, but for those who want a more custom experience and something that's maybe a little bit more white labeled and don't necessarily want uh, to have like Taurus kind of, you know, as part of this, as it is experience, they can build their own wallet on top of uh, basically this SDK that abstracts away exactly. all of the user experience aspects you mentioned. Imagine yeah. a Taurus wallet and remove all the UI. That's basically what Direct Auth is. Yeah. Uh, and, and so the, it's important also to note that Direct Auth is also secured via like the similar same domain security mm. model. Mm. So applications, if you integrate Direct Auth, it's not like they're getting your, your Taurus, user's Taurus key. Yeah, it's exactly. a different key. It's a different key. It's F specific to application. It's F so uh, do, do these then, are these different, I want, I'm want. i thinking about them in sort of like namespace terms, right? So perhaps some some app uses the direct auth uh, SDK and users are able to retrieve their funds using you know that specific, their specific wallet. Can they then log in, say, with Taurus or some other service provider and still access their funds or are they kind of like locked in in some name, namespace? So for direct auth, it's namespaced. And the reason for that is security, right? Because um, if they were, if a user logging in on any random integration with direct auth could access all of their keys elsewhere, then our security is basically the weakest link, which is the weakest, the most insecure that that uses direct auth. Which so, can be pretty insecure. Which can be pretty <laughs> insecure. So um, we, for direct off, it's actually namespace. The private keys are completely separate for each application. But I mean, in terms of like the ecosystem mm. and uh, whether or not they can leave the ecosystem, of course, <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we give back the public-private key pair. So as long as the wallet integrating direct off or even via the Taurus wallet, keys are always exportable. Mm. You can always take it away. Um, you can import keys into Taurus as well if you want to do so. Mm. Um, and people have decided to do, uh, and that actually is what facilitates our account linkability flows that mm. uh, a lot of users in the Web2 space are used to. For example, in the Web2 space, I can connect, um, if I let's say if I log in and start playing some game, I can connect both my Facebook account and Google account to it. And uh, you can do so, you can implement these flows via the Taurus network as well. Yep. Yep. So this is one of the things I wanted to ask you about is kind of portability. With this key, uh, this key generation method that uses Shamir secret sharing, what you get in the end is a private key. The, the combination of those shares, you know, uh, populates or, or generates a private key that you can then export and go plug into MetaMask or plug into whatever wallet you want. So you're, yes. I, I like this because with other solutions that do this kind of threshold thing or, or, you know, Arjun, for example, that uses smart contract, you're, you're kind of locked in. It's, I think it's, it's more difficult to take your entire account and your account history and like bring it somewhere else. You'd mm. have to transfer the funds. Um, 
And I like the fact that with Taurus, you can just take the private key if you want to leave and you can bring it somewhere else and manage it through another interface or even just have like two interfaces from which you're managing your your funds. You might want to have like, mm-hmm. I don't know, like on on some secure system, like have your private key there where you can also have a backup or something like that. So I, I like that portability aspect. And I think it's important because I, I would hate to see you know, crypto end up in this space where all these different solutions aren't necessarily compatible with each other. And, you know, some some of them are less compatible, I'd say, like smart contract wallets, it's harder to move away from that. My my view is that there's two ways to make uh, cr- like portability happen, right? Like one way is you use established standards. So s- examples of established standards are like Web3 providers, seed phrases, private keys, right? And, and if you implement your solution in a way such that it natively relies on that, then it's obviously possible to migrate your keys. And that's kind of what we do. We try to make it just a private key so you can use the private key elsewhere. Mm. And then the other way is try and push a standard. It's a lot harder, but it is possible. And we've seen some standards be pushed uh, for, for these kind of things. But, yeah, yeah. but, but that, it's that, a lot that, harder. That's definitely tough. It's, it's yeah. a lot tough. Um, yes. uh, yeah, and I mean, we definitely resonate with, with, with that statement that you just made and that mm. like interoperability is definitely very important. In particular, what we feel as well with regards to portability is the way we've kind of thought about, oh, maybe it should be developer facing. Maybe developers should choose where the keys go. Maybe it should be all. But I, ultimately, I think it all boils down. And this is the same in the Web2 space. It all boils down, I think, to, uh, to, to it should be user sovereign and user controlled. Mm. Basically, if a user so chooses to be on a particular platform, he or she Ultimately, the end vision that we have is he or she can choose to migrate um, when he or she wants to mm. on, on as a hard code. Um, and uh, yeah, as and with minimal resistance possible, as mm. as you as you feel the same. Mm. One of the things I also uh, I thought here, and I don't know if this is something that you guys do already or are planning to do, but because you're integrating with all of these uh, Web two platforms, how how easy is it then for someone to send funds using an email address or a Twitter handle? Is that something that you that you orchestrate for the user, or is that kind of a an added user experience layer on top of Taurus that someone would have to build, like kind of on in their app? So you can already do that um, in our wallet today. You can already send to Twitter, actually. You can send to Twitter. In fact, our latest campaign, uh, the charity campaign, Bitcoin Tuesday, uh, with is the block. yeah with, with the giving block, is, is using that. So you can send directly to, to the handles. Um, and and of these course, are tax deductible, by the way, just chilling a bit here. Yeah, these yeah. are tax deductible, tax uh, deductible. charity donations. So okay. if you guys want to, uh, if you guys want to donate, I've been looking to donate some crypto for a while. It's yeah. a booming market. It's always a good time to give back. Christmas, um, right? Thank yeah, you. check out yeah. check out uh, the Giving Block and a uh, Bitcoin Tuesday and mm. donate via the Taurus Wallet. Yeah, um, and it's totally possible. And not only do we do it via Taurus Wallet, Direct Off also has this functionality. So, so Direct Off allows you to to, to just um, look up a key based on a known user ID. So there are a few caveats, though. There are a few caveats. The first caveat is that not all not all um, social logins support this, and um, for example, one example, and this may be surprising to some, is Facebook. Facebook doesn't allow you to do this because Facebook is actually really privacy conscious with their SDKs. And if a user has not logged into Taurus before, there's no way to know what ID they have. And the IDs are also app scoped. So this way you can't actually send to a Facebook user. So, so this is another question then. If, if I send crypto using Taurus to some random Twitter account, do they need to have... Taurus wallet already, or is that something that they can do a posteriori and and like create that wallet later? They can, or? Yes. They can create a wallet later. Yes. Yeah. So how how that works? Yeah. Kind of kind of uh to go a bit into technical details, right? Because it sounds it sounds impossible, right? How do you do that? Before? Yeah. You do that how is the key? How is the key how known is if it's not yet generated? So, so as part of the DKG generation process, there are commitments made to the shares. So commitments are. Almost like uh, um, the hierarchy works something like this. Private keys have public keys, right? And shares have commitments. They're kind of, kind of like on the same... same the, the relationship between private key and the public key is the same relationship between share and a commitment. 
And as part of the DKG process, you have to publish commitments. Otherwise, you could just send bogus information to other servers. By reconstructing um, these commitments in a certain way, in the same way almost as how you reconstruct your shares, you can actually get the public key because the relationship is the same. Mm. And this is a known result that's already used in other DKGs. So, so you guys are free to check out on the one called DKG in the Wild by Anakit K, yep. who is our advisor. And um, that kind of allows us to get the keys, the public keys of unassigned keys. And then remember back at the start of, of, of this podcast, I, I mentioned that there are two parallel systems, right? There's a DKG key generating system and then a mapping system. Yeah. So what we do is the mapping system assigns you a, a new user who has never logged in before, assigns the user to an unused DKG setting, a, a DKG, right? And then that has a corresponding public key. So we do that, and because it's completely parallel, there is no reliance on this, this DKG setup. It is possible to send to this public key first, and then later on, when the user logs in, he can reconstruct his key. The public key is generated first, and then the DKG will kind of construct the private keys from the different shares, is, is that right? So As part of the construction of the shares, the public key is already known. It's already constructible. I wouldn't say it is constructed because the actual protocol doesn't require to construct it, but it is already possible because oh. the DKG is done. It's already possible to get the public key from the commitments. The funds are actually transferred then on the blockchain because the, the key is already known. So it's not like it's just sitting in your yes. system waiting for the. Yes, 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 yes. 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 It's actually yes. sent. You can see your ether scan, yeah. and and that's kind of um. And it basically can only it it makes because the keys are assignable. You. You, it allows for sending ahead of time mm. and you can basically retrieve it afterwards whenever you like. Yeah. As long as so you have the some, authentication to that. So there's account. some caveats. There's some caveats, right? So so the caveat is uh, you, like I said, Facebook doesn't allow you to look up. Um, some systems also uh, are, are harder. Like for example, there are some which, are, which give you back random IDs. So same problem as Facebook. And the last thing is also you have to remember that this is a threshold lookup. So you're sending it and the servers are reconstructing your keys. So these are some of the caveats, but overall it works almost the same as Taurus. I'm thinking here, could you do like PGP style uh, email? Like, could you do this with PGP where you say, okay, I've sent you an encrypted email. If mm-hmm. you want to decrypt mm-hmm. it, log in with, with Taurus mm. yes. on yes, some email client that would implement and- Taurus. Yes. Yeah, you okay. could. And that's exactly how uh, Skizzle works today. Uh, we have an application. You can download a Chrome extension, the Chrome store, uh, as in not our Chrome uh, our application. It's somebody built via direct auth. Um, that's how it, w- it works exactly mm. today. They basically uh, generate your key ahead of time. They use your public key to encrypt uh, an email attachment that you want to receive. And we send a- and you send it to that. And then... And when, then you, when, when you when you, get you log it, in, yeah. you get back the key and you decrypt that. Yeah, exactly. Wow, that's really interesting. That I think I think that's super powerful to be able to say to someone, or yeah, just like send a, an encrypted email without them having to generate any kind of like even knowing about PGP, mm. and then telling them, hey, you can un- unencrypt this email by using you know this application. Then I, I think that's super powerful. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Um, that that's cool. I mean, that, that that unlocks all kinds of use cases that I like. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I'd like to talk about Tiki. Uh, we haven't we haven't talked about that yet. And so, if we kind of recap, so the the, the Taurus network generates these key shares. Um, a, a user can can log in to a, a wallet um, using uh, either the 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 wallet you've generated or a third party application's wallet. But essentially, those keys are kind of only secured by the Taurus network. And yep. what you've built is you've built like another layer on top called Tiki that allows for, um, as I'd like to call I, I call it like a, a two-factor authentication on top of that, mm-hmm. um, where one either has to provide a password or uh, do some kind of like browser cookie thing. And maybe we can talk a little bit about like those different types of Second factor, but essentially it's like an added layer of security. Describe for our listeners what what this does and how it improves on the security model that you've already built in with with this with this secret sharing. You've you've very aptly described it, Sebastian. Yeah. Um, uh, 
So it is kind of like a form of 2FA. And really, it's for basically users who right now who, who want to detach even more from the Taurus network assumptions mm. or more of, more of less of the Taurus network and more of uh, the assumptions with regards to, let's say, your account being pegged to your Google account, mm. for example. So with, um, with the Taurus network, if your Google account is accessed and compromised, right? Um, because we use these faucets of authentication to validate and retrieve your public private key pair, uh, you also your your key gets compromised, mm-hmm. and uh, that that makes that that's basically a central point of failure that mm-hmm. we wanted to definitely um, address with future. I mean, we've had people want it, and as we as well as we wanted to provide a solution that and allows. And there are multiple ways to address it, right? You could do it in a centralized way. We could just send you an SMS code. Right, and, and or, or we can we can do mo- other things as well. You can do like a smart contract wallet mm. and use more more keys to secure and all that. But we want to stay true to our 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 vision of just providing private keys, primitive private keys that are usable in any use case, not necessarily even on blockchain. So on and, the technical level, mm. what this looks like, right, is you know the Shamir secret key that you get, uh, the the key that you get back from the Taurus network. That actually, the shares to that key are actually just private keys as well. And similarly, that private key can be another share to another hierarchy of Shamir secret sharing. So Taurus Network provides one key right now, but instead of using it as a key, use it as another share. As a share, yeah. As a share. And then your browser also holds a share, and then you have some user encrypted share as well via password or secret questions. And its base flow is basically 2R3. These 2FA, these ways that you manage the shares are basically flexible to the end user. Exactly. Yeah. And ultimately, the base flow that we propose is one of the Taurus network, one stored on the user's device, be it browser or a mobile application can start natively. Um, and the last one being kind of like a recovery share, being pegged to a password or something like that. Uh, but this recovery share could go above and beyond. And because what you're sharing on this share is, uh, I mean, what you're securing is one share and not the whole key, you're allowed to basically do uh, security questions on top of that. Mm. You could do 2FA solutions, which mainstream users are more familiar with, like sending it to a recovery email, mm. for example, uh, sending it to a SMS phone mm. number, um, so your your we still retain a base flow that is convenient. At the same time, offer a higher level of security and better guarantees to the end user. And to kind of like to just walk through it, like imagine if you're a user on Tiki and you had a share on your device, one on Taurus network, and a recovery share that's stored somewhere and protected by a password. If you are using it day to day you wouldn't use a recovery share because you were on an existing device, right? So you already have one of the shares. You log into the Taurus network and then you're done because you already have two or three. And if let's say your Google account gets compromised, right? The hacker tries to access your account, your TT account, but he doesn't have a device. So that attack is also blocked. And if you lose your recovery share, let's say you lose it, and people lose these things all the time, yes. right? Like who actually keeps a piece of paper in a safe, right? So people lose this all the time. If you do lose it, as long as you didn't also lose your device at the same on the same day, you're able to generate, because you're two out of three, you still have two out of three, the Taurus network and your device, you can generate another recovery share. So you can throw away the one that you lost and create a recreate your recovery share. Mm. This gives you some form of redundancy and it's actually a, a very popular way that um, existing enterprise facing uh, security companies uh, like BitGo and all that use. They so, already do something like this. Yeah, and um, additionally, it's really designed, so most users today have more than one device, right? Mm. We have our laptops or our desktop mm. and, and then we have a phone, right? Users using Tiki, Tiki is designed to be flexible to the end user and use device-based security. And to that end, when you use, let's say, if you try logging in, if uh, end users, you guys can try logging in via your phone and your desktop, um, you can actually create like a, you create a two hour four sharing. So you have mm. one share stored in your laptop, one share stored in your phone, and then you have like a share up on the Taurus network and a recovery share. Mm. And that automatically, uh, improves the amount of redundancy. It's unlikely you lose your phone and like, laptop at the same day. 
could it be that you have say one share kind of attached to a, a, a Google account and one share attached to maybe a Twitter account or is it, yeah. or is it uh, necessarily, you know, the kind of like Taurus stack on one side and then like a password or another device or something like that. So you can do that, but we advise not to do that because uh, you, you don't. Okay. So, so the reason for that is, is twofold, right? So a lot of people's Facebook accounts actually, are tied to their Google accounts already, right? right? So, so it's a hacker just needs to access your Google account and he can get your Google share and reset your Facebook account. So you, you, you're still like basically having only one factor. That's one problem, one mm. problem. The other problem is also by just relying on Taurus network sh- shares, you are still subjecting yourself to the threshold assumptions of Taurus network. And you could you could very easily avoid that by having just a device share. Mm. And and we want if you're gonna go through the trouble of actually having more factors of authentication, why not go ahead and give yourself even better security guarantees? But I mean if you're okay with it. But if you like it, yeah, sure, go ahead. <laughs> just don't use um, the same email. Yeah, it's <laughs> yes. yeah. Um and yeah, uh and we also enable for so for people who want an even higher level of security. You right? can do more. You yeah, can yeah, actually yeah. increase this threshold. So right now it's like two out of three or two out of four, right? But you could very easily increment this threshold to three out of four, for example. And that makes it more like a 2FA experience where a user um, has to, I mean, very similar to your banking accounts. You log into your banking account, you need to access your phone and tap something. For us, it's you log in with your desktop, you log into Google, you need to tap your phone on on your phone something and Mm -hmm. and, uh, to sign a transaction, for example. So this all sounds pretty complicated, but we've already simplified the entire flow such that a user can just use it today and mm. it's already live on us. Yeah, you, I signed up uh, for it yesterday and, and uh, yes. I, I did the, uh, well, I, I did create like my, my first kind of Taurus uh, mm. wallet and then it prompted me to do this, the the T key, which mm. I was surprised, but I guess I understand now it actually creates a second wallet and that's normal because oh, you're, yes. you're generating a new key set essentially. Exactly. Mm. And the, the options I had, so there, I need two out of three. One is the Taurus network the other is a cookie that's stored in my browser. So this, I guess, is like the device authentication that you mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. And the third is like a password. I suppose there's other, on your roadmap, you probably have other forms of second factor authentication that you're planning to roll out. Like browser cookies seem like a bad place to store a second share because I like personally delete those like once a week. Uh, what what kind of things are is on, are your, on your roadmap to make this process a little bit more... Yeah, maybe like having two devices or something like that. Yeah, so mm-hmm. definitely, as you mentioned, the two devices, um, mobile application, uh, mobile application is that one actually is already rolling working. Out as I think well. there are uh, two devices. If you try yeah. logging in on a different device, it will prompt you to use that as a recovery factor. Yes. Okay, in in the um, browser. Yes. Yeah, in the browser. Uh, uh, and, okay. and use it. We are also planning to use secondary uh, secondary email for this. We naturally have or, older style of also you can copy and paste it today, but yeah. we'll be offering it that in the onboarding UI as well. Now you can do it in settings, but uh, we'll be offering that in onboarding UI. Um, you can send it to your email, a recovery email address. So we recommend something separate from your existing Google account mm-hmm. and you can send a share there um, as well as a uh, phone number, SMS. Uh, and really, if you have any other ideas. Yeah, let uh, us know. If it's implementable, we, it, we'll build it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So something we've also been uh, contemplating it's, is uh, Touch ID. Yes, exactly. Um, um, and we've yeah. been working towards that um, and I don't know whether we we want to segue into that uh, next, or should we? Yeah, sure. I mean, let's sure. uh, uh, let's talk more about the the kind of UX challenges here. Um, yeah, what what kind of what kind of things are you thinking about in terms of building Touch ID? Where would those keys be stored? And I think most importantly, how are they backed up in such a way that, like, if I lose my phone, I can still access the mm. key, but it's not like unencrypted somewhere on my cloud. <laughs> yeah. mm. Exactly. Exactly. So. Um, there is this standard that's, that has been around for years. I think it's like three or more years. It's oh, crazy. Uh, called WebAuthn. So WebAuthn, it's become recently more popular because it's finally made it into mainstream browsers and properly supported. And that's how long it takes for web Yeah, that's how long it takes through. for these standards <laughs> to, to actually make it um, to mainstream. But WebAuthn basically allows you to use things like Touch ID to sign, sign, sign information, to sign in. And its purpose is for... for in, um, in the web browser. Uh, in the web browser, yes. 
Yeah, and I think I've, I think my now, bank recently told me to kind of really prompted okay, me to do okay. this. It, yeah, it, yeah, is, yeah. it is being used. It is being used by quite a few yeah. like security conscious companies in the mainstream. Mm-hmm. Right now, mainly it's being used as a 2FA solution. Exactly, yes. So they use it additionally on top of a password login, for example, mm. or they use it with a YubiKey. I'm not sure. If, I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah, so like a security external key. Um, but really, this is actually the reasons why this is doing so, they're doing so is because um, they are trying to comply with legacy systems. Right. And if you think of, uh, if you think of a login system from first principles up, you can actually create a completely username-less experience. Yes. Yeah, so uh, why, why do I even need like an uh, email to log in if the touch ID alone has some kind of public key that I can use to anonymously sign it, right? Yeah. So, so that's a, and it will be a much better user experience as well. There's no need to remember any credentials. I can just touch and, and get in. So that's kind of like what we've been working towards. But at the same time, you also mentioned a, a great uh, problem, which, which is that what happens if you lose a device, right? If you lose a device because the authenticator and touch ID is on your device, then that means your only way of logging is gone, which means you need to kind of solve challenges around how do you link it? It's touch, actually right? and and basically we've solved we, we we solve that on a daily basis because this is actually public private key pairs. This is MetaMask. Yes. This yeah. is like Argent on your phone, for example. Yeah. Um, and we use very similar flows as mm. well as potential social recovery flows. Mm. Um, so basically, it's all about account linkability. It's about using your um, account on different phones. It's about linking it up to your social account as well. Google, Facebook, or whatever. Mm. It's actually the same concept. As yeah, we're, we're glad that we can reuse a lot of the work we've already done for Tiki as well yeah. as Tars Wallet. Yeah. No, this is this is really cool. I, I I like the flexibility that you guys have built into the kind of base layer infrastructure where you're thinking of all the different ways in which people can construct, you know, their their own security. Um, model around their keys i i, I guess uh, but i wonder though in, in terms of user experience what responsibility do you think you have in educating users i guess primarily on t- to what extent they should be securing their keys based on things like how much money is in their account right so like if i open a t if i open a, an account using taurus and i've got like maybe a hundred bucks in there i'm like i don't know buying some nfts or something the risk of losing my keys and like catastrophic loss of my of my crypto is fairly low. So maybe I'm not going to enable Tiki. But like if I start using this to store lots of money, lots of crypto investments, etc., then you know, I I I would think that those users would want to secure their accounts uh in more meaningful ways. What kind of things are you doing to educate users or kind of help them along the way to say, "Hey, you know, there's a lot of money in this account or there's lots being secured here. You might want to think about implementing a second factor or you might want to think about like, I don't know, things like encrypting your hard drive on your computer if you haven't done so already. Because even if you lose your computer, well, someone could have access to your account by, by the simple fact that A, there's a cookie in your browser and B, yep. you know, your, your Google account is already logged in. <laughs> like just kind of simple yeah. education around personal operational security. So, so one of the benefits here is there are a lot of large companies who are a lot further along along this roadmap of like educating users about security than we are. And, and we already prompt users to use 2FA for their Google. And that's really important because that attack you just mentioned actually wouldn't work if the user, if the, the person who stole your device is on a different Wi-Fi, right? Because then Google will prompt the 2FA. And what you would do actually if you lose a device is you would sign up from all Google devices, right? That, that's often what a lot of people do if they lose like their Android phone. You would say, sign up from all my devices. And, and now um, to re-log in, they will have to somehow hack your account. Yep. Um, so that's, that's one way to kind of use these already pre-existing solutions to do it. The other way is uh, more native to Tiki. And, and we do prompt users when their account in the Taurus wallet exceeds a certain threshold. But we don't do that as part of Taurus network. And one of the reasons is exactly as you said, um, in order to keep the network flexible and as useful as possible to a bunch of applications, it makes sense to limit functionality to what it's good at. And the Taurus network is good at holding and holding, generating, retrieving, and sharing private keys, not necessarily prompting users, 
when their amount on a specific blockchain exceeds a certain USD equivalent, that's going to be quite hard to do from a network perspective. Instead, we leave it to front-end implementations to do this. And we have recommended guidelines for exactly like when to do it. But we, I would say it's definitely use case dependent. Ultimately, these like recommended a, guidelines are really dependent yeah. on audience as well. Exactly, and yeah. particular users to users. If you're a game, I mean, maybe not so much yeah, of an Yeah, if you're a game, yeah. well, I mean, it depends, depends on, on the how game much you're spending how much game. investment of your time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But essentially, it's like, if it's going to hurt, if you expect to, if, if you expect your audience, like, uh, if, if, it, if your account gets lost, nothing happens, then... Mm well, you don't really need much at all. But once uh, it, once it starts, maybe once it's uh, kind of goes like maybe, ouch, hmm, mm. that's an inconvenience, then maybe you might want to start adding uh, maybe one to FA or maybe ensuring that you have redundancy um, out there. And then uh, and then once you basically, it's it's really going to cost a lot. That's when you start using Tiki with higher levels of authentication. Mm. Um we also have external tools to allow you to do this. So you can do this natively in the Taurus wallet already. You can impl in, in, import existing shares and keys. But we're trying to build external tools such that uh, a user can completely export each of his shares. on. How, let's say you have two devices and shares on each one of them. We want our users to use these external tools that they can run locally to reconstruct their keys. So not only... This is important because not only do they actually um, back it up securely, they also fully understand the model they're in. They understand that this is what I'm doing, these are how the thresholds work, and they can choose what they will with it, not what they want to do with it. And ultimately, yeah. this is a very ongoing process mm. for us, to be for honest. Sure, yeah. It's, um, we, we kind of, we go through user testings, we, uh, we constantly kind of ask what these thresholds are. Mm. Um, we think about the guarantees that we need to offer, and then we think about whether we are the right people to do it. Yep. Another thing, I, another thing I think that's important is, you know, oftentimes if you create an account, you might secure it in the beginning. Maybe you know you've got like a, a secondary device or something, and then you get rid of that device, not remembering that you had a, a, one of your shares of your keys there. Yep. I think. Yep. One of the things I've seen companies do, like Signal does this. Uh, Signal has a second layer of of security on top of the key, which is a pin code. And like every mm. couple of weeks or whatever, it reminds you. So it's like, what's your pin code? Like just to keep, kind of yep. keep you yep. um, aware that there is this thing securing that that device or securing the data in in this case. Yep. And I think like reminding users, constantly reminding them, like once every couple of weeks, say, "Hey, mm. by the way, you know, you've got a there's a security key that's on this device. You know, you just reauthenticate it or just recheck yep. it to yep. make sure everything's Definitely. working." To and and that helps, I think, keeping that system kind of top of mind for people and remembering that they have, you know, maybe like lots of funds mm. like stored, and if they lose this device, then they would kind of lose access yeah. to it. It helps them sure. remember their pin as well. <laughs> I've seen that have I've seen that being used as well on like Authy, like the authenticator app, Authy. So they also have like this this uh, master password backup, and they remind you frequently. And if it doesn't matter if you forget it, uh, you just have to remember to reset it before you lose your device. So that's kind of how they do it as well. Yeah. I I, I got a couple of extra questions here on. Uh, you mentioned this briefly. You talked about people reconstructing their their shares. What mm. happens if Taurus disappears? Uh, if the company disappears, and what assurances do we have that the network will continue to provide, you know, the shares, uh, key shares for their users? What's the incentive for that model to continue uh, mm. to well, live that's, on? That's actually a, a great, great segue, segue into our ne next V2, segment. Yeah. But, um, but I mean, initially, we can talk uh, about things we've done now. Yeah, initially, yeah. Yeah. initially, right now with Tiki, right? Uh, that's the reason why we always advocate a two-hour three flow where a user is always in control of two shares. Um, in the event where Taurus, is, uh, Taurus leaves and all, the user is always kind of secured via him being able to reconstruct his or her share locally. And it's always accessible and always possible for a user to do so. And, and this, is, this attack is more... It, there are things that could happen that could make this attack possible. And it might not even be us just, just disappearing. It could be maybe... Um, them your, just, your country decides to ban the Tor to us domain, yeah. right? And, and then, because of DNS lookup and all that, there is it's going to be really difficult for you to get access yeah, to the yeah, site. Yeah, yeah. Um, it could even be just maybe Google just thinks uh, this is a bad idea, and then they decided to block all kinds of things that are like Taurus, um, or any kind of crypto application that could also 
happen. So, I mean, so. yeah, so there are a lot of these potential events. Mm. Um, and uh, basically, that's how Tiki kind of solves it. But mm. we also are constantly thinking about how Taurus V2 solves yes. it. Yes, and actually, there's a lot um, of things in Taurus that already solve this. So, yes. like, for example, our network isn't run by just us. It's run by a bunch of new operators. And our code is completely open source. So anyone can just fork the code so, and run their own network. Right now, the yeah. state of the network is, it is right now, the Taurus network exists as a permission network. Mm. And um, this, it exists as how it launched about a year and a half ago mm. when we first launched uh, to the public. Um, and the reason why we kind of launched it that way is because we're kind of like a team that progressively decentralizes. We wanted to provide value from day one. We didn't want to be one of those. Back in that, you know, 2017 period, it was mm. like, you know, all the shilly projects with tokens and all that. We really didn't want to be one of those projects at that point in time. Mm. Um, so we kind of went this route and we uh, we provided, we launched our solution um, We uh, and we launched with Taurus V1. And today it exists with nine node operators in a federated setup, um, inclu which are all large ecosystem stakeholders. Yeah. Uh, in, anyway. These include uh, a Can you talk about who Ethereum some of these service? ecosystem stakeholders are? Uh, yeah. Ethereum Name Service, Etherscan, Binance, uh, uh, Tendermint, Core, um, uh, Zilliqa. The the list goes on here. Uh, there are nine nodes in total, mm. and uh, we run one of them. Mm. Um, users can check this out at status. Uh, com and for uh, developers and you can actually check the network calls that are happening in your browser when the SDK logs in they actually go to these different servers like they're owned by Zilliqa or Binance yep. and so, you can see what's returning yeah so yeah. I mean right now it's a permission network but we are constantly thinking and we are actually in active development of um, shifting this permission setup mm. uh, slowly to become more decentralized yeah so the first step of that, uh, naturally, is with um, a uh, kind of introducing governance into mm. the, the the system itself. Right now, it's it's fully permissioned. We choose who nodes who the nodes are. Um, it's governed via a smart contract on Ethereum. Mm. And the first step there would basically be making it such that participants of the network, including applications, users, as well as uh, different uh, like the nodes themselves, um, can opt to choose who. Can uh, who can basically run nodes, um, and this helps, uh, and this can work because our node set is dynamic. Mm. Uh, that's tough with DKGs itself, and yeah. uh, we've put a lot of work there. So just thought to mention that. But anyways, um, and shortly after, we're actually shifting to basically a completely permissionless setup. Um, and, and part of the challenges there is, is also like incentives, right? How do you incentivize these servers to participate? Um, how do you kind of like make sure that being offline has like a penalty, so like you have to be able to slash them for not responding. So we've thought about it. Um, we actually have a pretty working model already. So we're thinking about like exactly what's the right way to kind of make that happen. Mm -hmm. And very likely, what's going to happen is uh, a, a large a, a large part of this will run this initial test net, and then we'll see uh, how to make that work first and the run it. The course, end vision, yeah. the end vision ultimately is a uh, naturally uh, all of your participants being mm. incentivized exactly, very yeah. similarly to how the ecosystem is incentivized today. Mm. Uh, With today token economics, etc., like you know fees. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's a, like a utility token. I mean, we charge a service as a, uh, a software as a service fee today, mm. uh, specifically to validate that applications would pay for this on their yeah. users' behalf. And that's similarly how we foresee um, kind of like the ecosystem the, the playing fees out. And incentives um, being paid ultimately, by uh, yeah. what we're aiming for is a decentralized key management system mm. that is competitive with centralized systems today. Mm. So it's very similar to, I guess you would call it Filecoin and Sire, whereas they are for competing with Dropbox. For us, it's a decentralized permissionless setup. Anybody can run a node. Anybody can offer their services. Um, and anybody can be part of the DKG setup. And the things that we replace are centralized solutions like Amazon Cognito, Auth0, or, or Google Firebase that exists mm. in the ecosystem today. And there are a lot of challenges that we are trying to solve along, along the way as well. Like for example, the Auth2 standard is by design very centralized and it actually leaks information about the user. Like for example, their email or their name. And if you're in a decentralized setup with a permissionless setting where anybody can join and leave, you kind of send these tokens everywhere. 
then you'll be like violating the privacy of a lot of users. And we are actually doing an ongoing uh, research grant as well uh, with uh, Weitier, who is doing um, a way to such a valid to validate all of two tokens um, using zk zero knowledge proofs. And what that would do is allow you to validate the token on the client side without sending the whole information to the back. So just these different yeah. uh, endeavors, which exactly, basically yeah. in totality, and our end vision is a decentralized decentralized tool measure. This is something I wanted to ask you too: is to what extent does using Taurus leak information about about funds uh, held by an account or transactions executed on on on, on like Ethereum or any blockchain? Can anyone? Say, look at an email address and figure out, you know, what the pro what the public key for that email address would be, and or, or or even perhaps you guys, like, is is that possible? And is this something that this zkp solution would address? So via Google, mm. um, via box. Google, yeah. uh, and via basically all different authenticators. The authenticators don't know anything except that you have logged in. Mm -hmm. um, it's just basically your handshake, and that's all of the information that Facebook uh, that or Google Facebook, yeah. or Twitter. After gets, that, we yeah. yeah after that, um, and in terms of what like data is accessible to an end user, um, or, or to a user like looking at let's say your email address via Tiki, there is no information available as well because basically we don't actually know your Tiki on, on, on your Google setup, mm. but via your Taurus key setup, there's basically, there is a mapping that mm. exists on the Taurus network itself mm. that maps like the, 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 the corresponding, uh, the corresponding, uh, the corresponding unique identifier for a login to your social account. And that is necessary because of the, lookups, the authentication yeah. Yeah. requirements. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, the, the ZKP would help with obfuscation of all other data mm. uh, pertaining to the login. Uh, but that unique identifier would still exist. And it's really like a double-edged sword here because that thing that you were very excited about, those lookups that you were very excited about is necessary in authenticating a user and is necessary in that particular handshake. But it also leaks, it also information, leaks yeah. information. That, that particular information is leaked and accessible exactly. because of that. So kind of like we recommend if you're trying to use like a more private setting, use Tiki. Tiki gives you better security guarantees. You are also private. No one knows uh, what the association is. We are just, Tiki just uses your Google login as a factor authentication. But if you really like the lookup feature or like if you're just sending to a friend a couple of dollars and he's never used crypto before, definitely try using uh, the, the lookup feature. Or also on that end, like because again, we're crypto native, mm. we've always felt that this particular, we want, we've always wanted to censor privacy to the maximum, like mm. as in like ensure the least amount of information is leaked possible. But for extreme privacy, right? It's always it's always possible to use other solutions which tout it, right? So like mm. Aztec, yeah. um, Electric Coin. Um, and that's easy to yeah. do because you use private keys. Yeah, right? yeah. So if you and wanted to, you can use yeah. Aztec. Yeah, so it's compatible with that. Yeah. Cool. So where can people find you and how can people start building in Taurus into their, uh, into their Web3 apps? So definitely, if you're a developer, do check us out um, on our main page and our docs, docs.tor.us. Uh, and also, we, base, we are very, um, we're very active on Telegram. Yep. So do check us out on Telegram. We have, we have a, a developer blog. chat as well yep. on Telegram, just specifically for developers who have questions. We answer everything there. A lot of our new features actually come from requests there. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and we have kind of like we we, have, we work hand in hand. Key management is a critical part of mm. a lot of uh, adapts application, an yeah. application stack. And in uh, for us, we particularly work hand in hand with a lot of applications. We help you guys. Uh, uh, I mean, not that everybody needs help, but like if you guys do, uh, we assist in kind of like architecting of the key management system mm. in terms of like uh, um trying to make it as seamless as possible for the guarantees necessary for your application. Mm. So really just do get in touch with us and talk to us. We really love to help. Uh, that said, you can get started and check out our code base as well. Uh, yeah. To get started with uh, Taurus really is a five minute integration. Yeah. yeah. And it's all open source code, all, all audited as well. Kadelsky for Tiki, yeah. a bunch of them for Taurus, Taurus Public. So yeah, check it out. Cool. Well, I'll, we'll link to all of those uh, links, your documentation and your telegram uh, in the show notes. 
And of course, I mean, anybody, even if you're not developing an app, I think you should just go to Tor.us and and just try creating a wallet. It's it's yeah. uh, it's a pretty incredible experience to be able to create a crypto wallet using you know your Google account or your Twitter account or you know, whatever kind of account you you, you like and um, just walk through the process and and have a get give yourself an idea of what what this process looks like and how you can create a crypto key using just a, a, a web2 login it's quite cool yeah 100 percent. yeah uh yeah if and do let us know what you guys think as yeah. users as well always open to uh, always love to hear great thanks a lot for joining me guys thanks so much thanks, sebastian guys. it's been a pleasure thank you